Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the U.S. Chamber Foundation's Path Forward series. Whether you're a regular viewer or new, we are delighted to have you. We have been having this series since the disruption and pandemic began in March, and we've had all kinds of guests from Dr. Fauci to Bill and Melinda Gates. We've covered all kinds of the topics around the pandemic and the economic disruption. And you could see them all on the website, uschamberfoundation.org. But it's really been about everything from the testing to the vaccines, to the treatment, to the future of testing, the future of uh, consumer confidence, how we get businesses to be confident and to safely reopen and sustainably reopen. But what we wanted to do today was really take a step back with a wider lens about the future of work. So we know that we've had this massive global health challenge. We know that it's been followed by a massive economic challenge. The question is, how much of these disruptions have accelerated change, accelerated the pace of change in a way that will stick and have ramifications for years to come? Which things might never go back to what we considered normal in March? That's what we want to get to today. What was the future of events, of business travel, of working in an office, of collaboration, et cetera? And we have a terrific lineup of panelists with us today to help us do that. We have today with us Ben Pring, who is Vice President and Managing Director of the Center for the Future of Work at Cognizant. His company, which has been a longtime supporter of the Chamber Foundation, is examining how work is changing, how it will change in response to new technologies, new best practices, and new workers. Also joining us today is Dr. Jim Harder, who is Chief Scientist of Workplace Management and Wellbeing at Gallup. Jim's research at Gallup focuses on the relationship between work unit employee engagement and various organizational performance outcomes. Finally, we have Dr. Nancy Rothbard, who is a professor and chair of the management department at the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania, one of the world's most prestigious programs. That is, of course, second only to Georgetown, says your double Hoya moderator. We will take audience questions at the end, so please submit your questions in the chat feature as we go along. Uh, ben, I want to start with you. Uh, you tell us about your future of work report and specifically about the headline, the future of work is now the present of work. <laughs> That's right, Suzanne. Um, no, thank you very, very much for having me on the on the session today. Um, well, I think up until March of this year, I think statistics suggest about 3% of people were working at home regularly, you know, sort of white collar bourgeois people working at home regularly. Um, that's something I've been doing for 25 years. And as you can tell, my accent's not from uh, uh, Georgetown or, or Boston, where I live nowadays. I, I'm from England originally, but I've been in the States over 20 years. And part of the reason I moved to the States was to, in effect, in effect live the future of life, to live remotely, to live on the cloud, to live a much more integrated lifestyle where I wasn't commuting to an office, wasn't putting a suit on, was working when I wanted to work when rather than a kind of traditional nine to five office shift. I saw that as an analyst in Gartner back in the mid nineties with the emergence of the early stages of cloud computing as a really, really kind of new style of living, a new style of working, very attractive to me. Fast forward uh, up till March, as I said, I always scratched my head and thought, why didn't more people do this? Why didn't more people work in this way where you have a you you arbitrage your salary? You have a city salary, but you live remotely in a bigger place, a nicer place away from the hustle and bustle and grind of kind of urban life. Fast forward to today. Lots and lots of people are having an immersion in exactly that life, the life that I thought 25 years ago was the future of work, which I was sort of was surprised hadn't come sooner. But now lots of people are having that experience. The fu that future of work is now. And I think what lots of people are experiencing, and I'm sure many people on the session today and people reading in the media, is that this kind of lifestyle, this kind of work style, is actually for a lot of people, not everybody of course, but for a lot of people, superior, um, preferable, uh, much more optimized to having a good job, a good life, uh, a balance, 
uh, that a lot of people have, have been seeking for a long period of time. And I think what's going to happen, uh, as you said in your introduction, a lot of the kind of changes at the moment are probably trivial and, and human beings, what they are, will kind of bounce back to some sort of form of the life that we used to and the work that we used to know. But I think one of the big profound changes that is going to settle with us and be with us for the long term is that a lot of people probably you know middle-aged bourgeois relatively successful people in the the mid stage of their career are now liberated from that suburban commute from that expectation that they have to be in the office monday morning at nine o'clock still there friday afternoon at six o'clock that the notion that working from home is synonymous with shirking at home which has been for a lot of businesses and a lot of uh, workers that's being shattered right now and i don't think that genie will ever go back in the bottle and i think what we'll experience going forward is people optimizing this style of working i'm not suggesting that the office is dead or the city is dead we'll still go back into those environments but we'll have a much more balanced, nuanced, subtle way of being in the office when we need to be and not being there when we don't need to be, when we can do our expenses or write a report sitting in our office at home. I think that's a very real shift that's been coming up as the technology supporting that for a number of years has become more mature, more stable. And I think that's with us uh, for the long run. So beside my two takeaways from that are number one, that you, sir, should have been my life coach 25 years ago. <laughs> so I don't know where you were, but uh, my other takeaway is I understand what you mean from the employee side, but as you speak to an audience of employers here, how would you advise them to be planning for that future if the future is coming upon us more suddenly than they expected? Yeah, no, that's that's exactly right. I, I think if companies want to be employers of choice going forward, then they're going to have to accept that. They're going to have to accept that this is a reality which is here with us for the foreseeable future. And what they need to do is to think about how they optimize that for productivity, for uh, business continuity, for optimization. And I think if you think about that, and I'm, I'm sure other folks in the session are going to talk about this, is that the way we sort of managed and measured work, particularly bourgeois kind of white collar work historically, has been with pretty simple um, KPIs, pretty simple measures of objectives, of, of, of units of measurement. And of course, the most common one has simply been time served. Uh, and we know, you know, the phrase of presenteeism that you know, people talk about, that that is a reflection of the, of the fact that really it's just been a, a sense that as long as that person's physically somewhere co-located to me, physically you know in, in sight, I've got a sense that they're doing their job. And we know that's not true, particularly in this age of you know multiple devices. People have got personal phones. People have got you know the, the company uh, issued a computer as well. We know that that's been breaking down for a while. And what this behooves of the manager of the employer is to have much better metrics to manage work. And I think it, it really boils down to, as a manager, knowing, understanding what that objective for that person is, for that team is, for that BU is, having clear objectives and allowing them to do that at a time that's optimal for them. I mean, personally, in the way that I've worked, in the way the teams I've managed, um, you know, we've broken away from that just simple time served in a regular you know, nine to five uh, environment. If you want to work four o'clock in the morning on Sunday and write your code, write your report, I don't care. If you're delivering high quality work on time, on budget, I don't mind. I don't care how you do that. Now, that's a big shift. That's a big change culturally, uh, operationally. Uh, from a financial metric perspective, that's a big change. And I'm not, I'm not trying to underplay that, that challenge for a lot of organizations to get with that. But again, I think that if you want to be an employer of choice, if you want to embrace the next generations of digital talent that you're going to need to remain relevant in a world that's obviously transforming into becoming a sort of digital first environment very, very quickly, very rapidly in front of our eyes right now. Unless you're able to do that, 
to say goodbye to some of those old metrics and, and adopt and embrace newer metrics. Again, I think that's going to be challenging. So how does that relate to a services business, right? So I had read about your suggestion that there should that every weekend should be a long weekend. We should go to a four day work week. And one of my thoughts was the dilemma we have at places like the chamber isn't what time we give people off. It's when our members or our customers engage directly with people. And so yeah. as we think about the flexibility of write your code at four o'clock in the morning, that works if you're a coder. But if you're a consultant, a lawyer, a, a trade association person, and you are client facing, it would really take a whole expectation on your customer's part of a change, right? Or how do you think about that in the in the service business context? Yeah, no, that's that's a very good point. And and, and again, I think what this is going to require from a managerial, from an organizational perspective, is an ability to have much more flexibility in how work is actually undertaken, recognizing that if, as you say, you're in a service orientated environment, you need to be there when your clients are there. You probably in the, in the back end of that in how the work is actually done, need to think much more about shifts. You need to think much more about the decomposition of tasks and the, and the distribution of those tasks to, into a sort of follow the sun uh, model, which obviously in, in my world of tech based services has, has become you know, very common and very mature over the last 10, 15 years. Uh, I'm not suggesting for a moment that if you're a lawyer, <laughs> you're going to be in a position to say to your uh, your clients, sorry, it's 11 o'clock on a Tuesday morning. I'm not working because I was working, you know, last night at midnight. That That's not a reality. But I do think we're going to see much more flexibility, much more, as I say, the key word to me is decomposition of tasks, uh, breaking jobs up into tasks and allowing those tasks to be done in a much more flexible way. You know, that, that makes me think that there are two things employers have to think about. One is kind of the hardware or, you know, technology side, the equipment side of how you need to follow the sun. And then there's kind of the soft skills side of the trust and compassion that's needed to get there. So can you talk a little bit about the technologies you're most excited about and the soft skills that are needed to make this new environment work? Yeah, no, that's right. I think clearly we're all experiencing more and more people are experiencing a world of cloud, a world of uh, online conferences like this, a world of instant messaging where we're we're in Slack or in WhatsApp the whole time. And, and I think those tools are sort of you know, probably pretty well understood, although unevenly distributed, not everybody using them to the same degree. But I think you raise a very interesting point, Suzanne, about the managerial soft skills that go around this. And I, I've long been arguing that the, the challenges that big businesses be, have been having with digital transformation, which has been a sort of a holy grail for a decade or so, even longer now, is that they focus more on the technology than the transformation of, of skills, of talent, and particularly of culture, the culture of work. And I, and I think, it, again, there's much more need to think about those soft skills, how you manage teams, how you support teams. And I think my experience in this last six months or so is a lot of big businesses are recognizing that and realizing that, that the, 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 the MO, if you like, of managing distributed teams is, is going to be quite different. One thing I, I think, um, and I, I don't know whether there are any uh, English Premier League fans uh, listening in today, but if, if people who know that uh, what's been going on in England recently know uh, about Liverpool uh, winning the, the Premier League recently, um, 30 years ago was the last time they won the, the, the top soccer competition in the UK, in, in England. At that time, they had one manager who basically did everything. If you saw the team, the management team that won the Premier League the other day and were given their medals, there were about 12 managers. And what that what that says to me is that we've seen much more specialization in sports, but I think this is a metaphor you can extend it to lots of different industries. And particularly the key aspect of managerial support that they've added is that individual one-to-one -one coaching. 
And I think the role of the manager going forward is, is going to be, in essence, a, a coach. It's going to be a personal private coach for relatively small teams, checking in in the way that a coach would do in a game, giving real-time instantaneous support feedback, leveraging modern AI-based tools to provide a kind of different level of, of, of managerial support. Uh, it's not going to be some, you know, one guy on the top of the mountain barking orders from a distance. It's going to be much more integrated, much more micro scale, much more wirearchy, if, if people know that phrase, not a hierarchy, but a wirearchy of people working in a much more collaborative, much more real time model to support people working in this kind of strange new way. Okay, we've got a lot more to talk about with you, but next I'm going to bring in for for the next segment, uh, Dr. Jim Harder from Gallup, and and I think this is a perfect segue because what I wanted to start with is to ask you about the relationship between employees and employers, the relationships between individuals in this time of COVID-19, and and what you see is changing. Hi, Suzanne. Great. Thanks for having me. Um, you know, we saw prior to the pandemic that flex time was the most desired perk. About 44% of people said their company offered some form of flex time. Um, prior to the pandemic, only 5% in our US data uh, were full-time work from homers, basically, work from home remote people. That suddenly shifted to a peak of 70% uh, during this pandemic, and it's now in the 50s, but still, uh, still over half of people. I'd also point out though that um, a study by the, uh, from the University of Chicago showed that about two thirds of jobs that they evaluated just can't work from a work from home setting. So I think we have to take that into account too. These are the jobs that are left after the layoffs and everything. And um, so, you know, we've asked people, to, so you asked about the relationship, the preference, uh, has this forced experiment been working? Um, from an employer perspective, about half um, who said that they allowed work from home uh, during this pandemic said they'll change their policy in the future. Um, and about two thirds of them said they would they would allow more working from home. So you asked about the employer perspective uh, just a little bit ago. Most employers still right now say they're gonna change their policies one way or the other. And from an employee's perspective, it started off about two thirds preferred it and then it kind of dropped off to a little bit over half, but still a sizable number of employees say this is kind of working um, and there's some ways to make this work. Um, of course, uh, that the extreme amount of work from home is temporary. And I expect that um, it's somewhere down the line when there's a vaccine and things uh, get, get back to uh, some level of normalcy, that there'll be so, sort of a hybrid model. You'll have some people that'll, that'll, that'll switch back to full time, but I think you're gonna have a lot more hybrid models where people are kind of going back and forth, depending on the mix that's right for them as an individual. And that's where management comes into play and is really important here. Um, the other thing I'd point out is employee engagement has fluctuated uh, more than we've ever seen it during this pandemic. Um, and that's that's been due to a lot of factors hitting people all at once. And employers, um, you know, their initial response was really good, uh, but it kind of backed off. And I think employers and supervisors need to, need to be thinking a lot more about communication going forward. I think there's been a little bit of relaxing um, from that perspective. So since most of the viewers today are employers, what's your advice about what they can be doing better to engage their employees? Well, we found that the, the best policy, and we've learned a lot by studying data during this time, the best policy uh, lies within the right mix for each individual along with a great manager. And so if you're really gonna put it down in a nutshell, um, going forward, we've gotta have great managers in place that create the right mix for each person. And that depends on a lot of factors. It, it depends on um, their role. It depends on their personal situation going forward schools opening, all those kinds of things, kids at home. I mean, there's all those personal factors. Their strengths are really important. Some people just naturally work well in a remote setting, others don't. And others really need that interaction either for their role or their team or for them as an individual. Um, and so uh, about 70% of the variance in team engagement we found over time is related back to what managers do, both in terms of the talents they bring in, you know, utilizing their strengths, and then also uh, how they coach how they coach their employees, how they move from kind of, as Nick was saying, moving from a, being a boss kind of environment to a coaching environment, which really aligns with what this uh, newer workforce is asking for 
you know, Suzanne, it's kind of interesting to me that these these trends that we're seeing now kind of forced on us were already kind of in play before. Um, the newer workforce wanted more flexibility. Um, the newer workforce wanted more of a coach than a boss. And so the more organizations can respond to that, that they'll not only help um, fix what's going on right now, but they'll also prepare themselves for the future. And that means upskilling managers in terms of what they can do. I think, you know, both you and Ben have talked about this coaching aspect and how you manage, how you upskill managers, how you get them to be a different type of manager in this pandemic. Um, and yet you're trying to upskill them and do this at the same time that the world's gone to, you know, just, just to pieces. And so mm -hmm. you're trying to learn your own new skills. You've got new technology. It's harder to collaborate. You don't have people in a room. And, and it strikes me that both it's harder to manage and that more is being expected of managers. And, and so shifting for a minute away from management to leadership, mm -hmm. another piece is how do you inspire? You know, how do you not just engage and, and be a better manager, but kind of lead and inspire in this time? Yeah, that's a great question. We had a chance to study uh, from a leadership perspective right as this pandemic was hitting. We asked a lot of questions and we found there are really four kind of keys to inspiring a workforce. Um, from a leadership perspective. And they, they're really around four themes that we've seen in, from followers of leaders historically. One is hope. Um, so you've got to communicate a clear plan of action. The first thing people want to know is what's going on? What's my role in all this? And to inspire hope, people have to know what's what's going on in the organization, what the organization's plan is. Um, that was a really good response initially from employers and it kind of backed off. And now I think it's starting to pick up a little bit more again. So there's been a little bit of a correction. So there's hope, stability, trust, and compassion are four areas that all followers need from leadership. Stability really comes from helping people. This seems really basic, but helping people be prepared to do their work. Um, and, and that, of course, changed. So it's a new environment. Um, everything's changed. We've got to kind of regroup. What, what are my strengths? What are my team's strengths? How, uh, what do I need to do my work from a different location? And so uh, that preparation part is really important. Again, very basic, but extremely important, often overlooked. Trust is really important. That's where leaders leverage supervisors. Their best leverage point are supervisors or managers because they can keep people informed on what's going on in the company in a way that's contextual for them as an individual in terms of their work. And then compassion, uh, it's really important that leaders help people see how they're in it with them in terms of helping them improve their well-being. They actually care about their overall well-being. Um, work and life were more blended than ever before this pandemic hit, now suddenly totally blended uh, for a lot of jobs, those that can work from home at least. And so um, the, just showing that you care about their well-being in a lot of different aspects, not just work, but also how, how work intersects with their family life, how work uh, intersects with their finances, um, how, how work intersects with, with, uh, with their community, the community they live in, and what role they can play in the community they live in, and, and the, even their physical well-being. Um, and what they can do to help out with that. So um, that well-being component is important as well. And uh, um, and so I, I think those four or four areas that really highlight, um, do everything you can to, to instill hope, stability, trust, compassion, but also transparency is really important. Transparency, context for why we're doing what we're doing, and then how are we going to get from where we are now to some place in the future, even though it's uncertain. It reminds me of that old Gallup true or false set of if you know pe more people if more people answer true than false then they're more likely to stay engaged at work you know one of them was do you have the resources to do your job right which is do you have the yeah. authority to do your job do you have a friend at work you know those those questions I remember well talk to me for a minute you just you just talked about how we're all blending work and life in a totally different way in this moment and it's leading to a lot of burnout you know, particularly people whose schools aren't opening or their child care centers aren't opening and they have young children at home and they're trying to work full time and or or people who haven't started a family who live alone who are lonely in this time um, it just we're seeing a lot more burnout now my question to you is how do employers help their employees with that problem yeah um, so uh when this pandemic first hit, we saw record spikes in stress and worry, um, unlike we'd ever seen before. The percentage of thriving people, even in the workforce, that were still in the workforce, dropped more than we'd seen it before. And we've been tracking this since 2008 in the U.S. Um, and, and we've we've looked at a lot of these same things uh, in Europe as well. Um, so 
about 70% of people report burnout at least some of the time. About a fourth say it's very often or always, so those are the, the more extreme cases, but 70% say at least some of the time. Um, some of the risks when you're in a remote environment that, that might add to or tend to add to higher burnout would just be the, the, the lack of separation between work and life. Um, and so strategies for knowing, that's why, why that, uh, that coaching aspect is so important because knowing the individual, their strengths and their situation allows a manager to set them up for success in terms of, of how they can make that separation when they need to and adjust. It's a very individually based approach, but that's really what ends up being fair. Um, detachment or isolation from a team, loneliness, uh, being unseen and unheard. Um, so we have to really overcompensate for that. When we've studied remote workers, even in the past, they tend to be lower on that social component you were just talking about, Suzanne. Um, they, that's one area they're lower. They also tend to be a little bit more vulnerable when it comes to development. And so are we continuing to push forward in terms of learning and development and how we help people see what their future can look like in the organization, and how they can keep growing and developing during this time that's, a, that's, that's very different. Um, and that, that other one I mentioned a little bit earlier was ch changing the expectations of how work is done. That whole shift in expectations means that we've got to be thinking with people about their goals every week. We need to have um, ideally multiple points of feedback where we're checking in with people every week if we want to boost engagement in a highly remote environment. And uh, a lot of that should be centered on goal setting, reestablishing goals, helping people and also involving people in setting their goals so that they, they feel like they're a part of it. Um, that's th that's a simple piece right there, involvement in goal setting that oftentimes gets overlooked that really boosts engagement a lot because people want autonomy. So I think the thing to keep in mind in this in this situation is that um, on one side, we're increasing autonomy, which people want. People have always wanted that. On the other side, we've increased the risk of confusion. We've increased the risk of, of, of role clarity. And so we've got to really push hard on that and, and, and become really good at, at setting goals. But you know, those are, those are things every manager, every, every leader can, can uh, ask their managers to do and every leader can do themselves is to have those times every week where they're reestablishing goals, thinking about whether the goals are still relevant and how people are progressing toward those goals and how they're developing at the same time. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because it's easy to think about employee engagement and organizational behavior and some of these softer skills as nice to haves in a time of crisis. When in fact, if I'm reading your research correctly, it's really the opposite, that it decreased employee engagement leads to decreased productivity, decreased profits, et cetera. So can you talk about why this isn't a you know soft side of business, why it's integral to the business plan itself? Yeah, and we've uh, we've done we're working on right now our tenth um, iteration of uh, meta analysis of business unit engagement and performance, and uh, we've seen this across time. There have been other studies outside of Gallup that have found similar things, and that's really that there's a there's a strong link between how people perceive their work environment and so that human side and uh, and performance. A lot of it's related to a lot of the concepts we've been talking about here: clarity of role. Um, do I feel connected to my coworkers? Is there a mission or purpose? That's a big one. If you can help people see in a time of crisis how their work connects to something bigger, that, that goes a long ways. We did a study um, that we just published in Human Performance uh, across 62,000 business units. And this was uh, across a couple decades. So we had two recessions to look at across the world. And we found that engagement was an even stronger predictor of performance during recessionary times than non-recessionary times. You might ask, well, why is that? How well, it, it turns out that when, when people um, feel engaged in their work environment, they become a big differentiator when times are tough. And, and on, on the other side of it, you're more vulnerable if you don't have high engagement during, a tough, during the tough times. And creating high engagement, um, while it takes work, it's, uh, it's pretty straightforward, really. It's, it's about uh, m making sure that people know what their role is, getting people in a position where they can use their strengths, recognizing them when they do good work. Recognition is another one that's it's free. Um, you can do it anytime, any day. You notice someone doing something good, but you have to kind of be in touch with them right now to know whether they're, they're, they're producing, and that's where those goal conversations are so important. Thinking with people about their development, all these concepts lead to high levels of engagement, helping people see how their work connects to something bigger. And so um, that was an interesting study that just happened to be published right when this pandemic hit, um, so timely as well, I guess. But um, it's been, 
it's it's been about two decades of work, you know, looking at that relationship across different business units and organizations all over the world. All right, let me turn and bring uh, Nancy into the conversation here. Uh, Dr. Rothbard, we're so lucky to have you with us from Wharton. Uh, we appreciate your patience as we got to here on the panel, but we have a lot of questions for you. And one of them is, do you think the workplace ever goes back and looks like it did in mid-March? That's a great question, Suzanne. I think that in the near term, no. Uh, it, it, I think we're, this is with us for quite some time, but I think that, you know, going back to some of the themes that Ben was raising earlier, I do think that we are going to see uh, a return to the office at some point. Uh, what that looks like, whether it is, you know, fully returned or, or whether we're partially returned, I think we'll, it, we, we're, we're yet to see, but but I think that there is a desire amongst many people to reconnect face-to-face uh, -face with folks. I, I think, um, as Jim was saying, you know, people re have reacted really amazingly to some of the challenges. They've risen to the challenges of remote work. But I, I do think that it is, it is taking a toll in terms of relationships and some of these um, needs for connection and growth. I think that's right. And, you know, it's interesting the relation between connection and some of the boundaries between work and life, you know, how you used to use a commute or how you used to use a lunch break or a coffee break or just a moment in the hallway and, and how it's changed how we're working. And I know that you've written and, and thought a lot about boundaries and would love to hear your views on how this has all changed. Absolutely. I think that one of the biggest uh, changes for many of us, and again, I, I want to be really clear that for those of us who are actually privileged to do remote work, right? There, you know, this is this is a, a segment of the economy. It's it's a large segment, as the Gallup data has shown us. Uh, but you know, it, it's it's also a privilege to have been able to do this. I think for many of us during this period. But for those of us who are engaging in remote work, I think that one of the things that's really that stands out about it is that the boundaries have become very uh, porous and permeable between work and non-work life. I am sitting here right now in my kitchen. That is that is my new office and it is a really great place for me to be because it's the hub of the house. My kids, you know, during lunchtime, I can kind of be in a meeting and quickly, uh, quickly transition to make my kids lunch. Um, I, I know what's going on. I can keep tabs on people, but it's also a really distracting place to be. Um, as, you know, for with those activities going on, as I'm trying to you know do meetings or be in, uh, you know, focused on some of my writing, etc. And so, you know, that kind of example of the blend between work and life, I think, is one that many of us are experiencing. Those transition rituals. We don't have the commute to be able to clear our heads and get in the work mindset as we go to work or as we come home from work. And so it's really a very different situation in terms of thinking about how do we how do we manage the boundaries that we need and how do we how do we recreate some of those boundaries um, that that may be necessary for us to be able to focus on our work. Uh, and to be engaged, uh, as, as Jim was talking about, right? You know, part of the engagement is to be able to be present and focused on what on the task at hand. You recently wrote an article for the Harvard Business Review, it, and let's be really clear that Harvard is definitely not as cool as Wharton or Georgetown. So we're going to put them way <laughs> behind us. Um, but you just wrote an article for HBR that talked about. Uh, segmenters and integrators. And I'd like for you to tell the audience what those classifications mean and, and what they tell us about this really important topic uh, about employee engagement and, and how to engage them. Sure. I mean, I think that um, one of the things, so so segmenter, I, I've done a lot of work on boundaries, as you've mentioned, and, and this idea of people who prefer to 
keep a clear boundary between work and home. And those are the, the folks that, that we call segmenters. They try to segment their work life from their family life. They keep them separate. They're, those are the kind of people who will only take a uh, like a, a personal call or like maybe make a doctor's appointment for their kids during their lunch break, right? They won't be doing it, you know, in the middle of the work day. Um, or they they try to, um, they don't talk about their family at work. They try to keep that kind of, you know, work is work and home is home and never the two shall meet, right? Would be the extreme version of a segmenter. An integrator is somebody who, by contrast, really prefers to blur those boundaries and will talk about their non-work life with their coworkers, will take work home and, and work on, on work during family time, or will um, we'll bring members of their family to work. Uh, you know, they'll, those are the kind of people who have lots of pictures of their family in their office and, and talk about them and et cetera, right? So um, as somebody sitting in my kitchen right now, I'll tell you I'm more of an integrator. If I were a segmenter, I would not be sitting here in the kitchen, even though it's the hub of the house, it's my best internet connection and it's really convenient. I would be finding a room with a door, okay? And so, there are really different ways that segmenters and integrators will enact their work and their non-work life, whether in the workplace or whether at home. And so, so when we think about these different preferences and different ways of enacting the boundaries, I think it's really important back to the point that Jim was raising about managers coaching individually and really being able to understand who their employees are. If you are working with somebody who's an integrator, some of these boundary crossing uh, things are going to be less problematic. If you're sending them an email after hours, it's going to be less problematic. If you're working with a segmenter, you, you need to recognize that those kinds of lines are more sacrosanct and it's more challenging for them if you're going to be kind of asking them to do things outside of those lines. And so that's always been important. And now in the situation that we're currently in, we're all living in an integrator's world mm -hmm. and segmenters are really struggling with that. And they are having to really work hard to keep the boundaries that are important to them and, and maybe flex a little bit and maybe realize that all of those boundaries aren't possible, right? So. You know, maybe what they would do if they were sitting in a, if the only, if they were in a studio apartment and they didn't have the ability to go somewhere else and they had to be in their kitchen, they might put a screen up in back of them, right? So that you couldn't actually see their kitchen, right? Or, or something like this. So they're, they're, they've got to find ways to make this work for them, but it's a lot harder. For integrators, they also need to be thinking about the fact that while they prefer to blur those boundaries, as an integrator, I'm sitting in my kitchen, but there are certain boundaries that I can't I can't let be blurred. I told my son, you know, between three and four, I'm on this call. Please don't come down to the kitchen. Right. And he's old enough that I can manage it that way. Right. And so so I you know, we, we've got to work and think about that much more intentionally in this period, both as employees and as managers or employers. So when you think about how long you've been thinking about some of these things, it makes me wonder what about this time period has surprised you? So I, I, I think, yeah, that's a great question. I think that there have been so many surprises. One surprise I've had is how seamlessly people seem to have transitioned into this experience because the statistics that Jim was quoting before, right? 5% of people were working full-time remote in the U.S. prior to this pandemic to at, at the peak, right, this in the 70 percent percentile. I mean, that's that's an enormous shift. And, and the fact that we haven't had more trouble with it is, is quite surprising to me. Mm -hmm. um, the, the second um, big surprise for me is how I think much we also miss each other. Right. I think a lot of times we are kind of we're, we're all busy. We're all trying to we're all very task focused. And I think that um, the, the the I mean, I study relationships, so this shouldn't surprise me. But 
the the value of relationships with our coworkers and how much that is a part of the fabric of our lives has been i think made more prominent and salient to me so maybe not a surprise but it's certainly it's certainly been made more uh visible to me yeah it's interesting i think we're, a lot of us are seeing a younger generation who thought they wanted to only work from home who are pretty eager to get back and an older generation who to, to quote a panelist thought it was shirking from home saying no i'm actually really working and so you wonder if there's optimism um kind of like what ben was saying in the beginning about how uh the generations or the two different sides come together when this is over you know and it makes me ask more generally what do what other trends might you see that make you optimistic about the future of work and and building work-life boundaries are we learning enough that maybe maybe it gets better from here well i am an optimist so i, I i'm going to take the optimist uh view of this i you know it's, it's dispositional i can't help but be optimistic um, i'm really i'm really optimistic about Again, the technology that and the, the technological advances that we have seen that have enabled us to work so seamlessly from home, right? To be uh, connected in the way we are right now, right? To to be able to create the reach that we've been able to create, that really gives me cause for optimism. I also think that you know we have an incredibly um, an incredibly talented group of people that's only getting more skilled, right? It, you know, by necessity, but those skills are going to carry over, I think. And then the third piece of my optimism actually uh, goes back to something Ben was saying earlier that I actually think my hope is that it's going to make us better as managers. We have to be clearer about what we expect from people. And if we can be disciplined about that, and if we can be, if we can bring ourselves to do that out of necessity through this pandemic, I think that that's going to make us better managers and leaders for the future, right? All of these are the basic skills we need as leaders and managers, but the necessity of them is hopefully going to make us much more um, skilled at doing many of these things. I, I think that's that's absolutely the hope, right? And if if that's the optimism side, I don't want to say the pessimistic side, but as you mentioned, th these conversations tend to uh, lean towards the people who can work from home, right? And we know that there are a lot of people, particularly lower income people who can't. And so how does the future of work and this new way of working impact the people who just can't work from home? So that's my big concern. You've just hit it the nail on the head with uh, Suzanne with my big concern is that essentially this is creating a digital divide um, between the people who have high speed internet in their homes who have the technology or who have or who have jobs that are you know organizations that are sending the technology to them to be able to to do this um, for those who don't you know it's it's a very challenging uh, situation certainly right now from a health perspective uh, but also from a skill perspective right as as those as those skills those digital skills those video conference skills the, the ability to um, know how to manage this new world that that's that's going to create a lot of challenges that I worry quite a bit about for workers who are not in the types of jobs that are easily lending themselves to remote work. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, you think about people who aren't verbal processors, you know, who really just need some time to think before they present. It, you're right about the skill piece too. It's it's fascinating to think about. Uh, okay, so I want to bring in the, uh, the all the panelists here because we have a number of audience questions, but I'm going to stay with you, Nancy, for the first one because there's an audience question that says, are there gender differences between segmenters and integrators? So that's a great question. Um, there, there, are, there are a few studies that have shown that um, women are a little bit more on the integrating side uh, and men are a little bit more on the segmenting side. So it's sort of like a, a kind of segmenting, if you think about it as compartmentalization, um, you know, kind of 
I, I leave, I leave uh, work and I, I turn work off and I'm focused on my family or I leave home and I, I, you know, I stop worrying about what's going on in the family. So there's a little bit of, of, a, of a correlation between that. However, it's not that strong. I think that there are there are lots of men and women who fall into both categories and it's and it's usually measured on a continuum. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. OK, so let me then let me ask you this next question, which is uh, the, the audience member wrote, we're in such uncertain times. How much is this affecting employee confidence and therefore productivity? No, I think going back to what uh, Jim was saying, I, I think that first wave of uh, this breaking, everybody reacting, everybody panicking, everybody scrambling. Uh, of course, people were very, very focused on job security at that stage. Everybody working double shifts, long days because everybody could see sort of writing on the wall here. And, and as Jim pointed out, that's sort of unsustainable over the long term, that kind of sprint that we all went through. So I think that is a, a, is a big factor. And, and of course, underlying all of this discussion and everything that Nancy and Jim have been saying is exactly right, that, that this is like a virus does. It, it's targeting who's strong, who's weak. And we're seeing across all sorts of aspects of society where those weaknesses are, where there's cracks in our society and in, in the way that uh, our lives work. And, and, and so this is, is a huge wake up call. I, I've been calling this the biggest existential challenge to us since the, the Second World War. And I'm still of that opinion. Uh, probably people have a bit be, been uh, beginning to hear this phrase this week, the, the K-shaped recovery, not a V-shaped or a U-shaped or an L-shaped, mm -hmm. but a K-shaped recovery. Some people probably overrepresented on this session now doing OK and a lot of people not doing very well at all. And uh, again, I think this is all uh, bringing into focus, into a concentrated relief, if you like, trends that have been going on for a long period of time um, that are, are troubling if you look at them too closely and, and, and worry about them. So, um, no, I think this is going to force a lot of people to look at things with fresh eyes, um, which may be one of the silver linings that comes out of this uh, very, very difficult period. You're right that we do talk about the difference, uh, the different impacts on different socioeconomic levels uh, around the world. We're getting an audience question about kind of generational impact. And the specific question is, do you foresee an increase in early retirement as older workers choose not to deal with learning how to work remotely? For me or for Jim? Well, let's start with you and then we're going to go to Jim. Yeah, one of the things we've been talking about for a while is is uh, people will know that phrase um, uh, uh, live long enough to live forever. This idea that technology is sort of keeping people uh, alive longer and uh, and people are working longer. And we, we've been looking at that quite a lot. The notion that people would be able to leverage the gig economy. Uh, Mechanical Turk, Uber, all sorts of platforms that are emerging to allow people, you know, older people who still want to work or need to work to keep in the game, if you like, longer. Clearly, if the economy does does badly, people's 401ks become 2-1-0-ks, uh, you know, a lot of older people are going to have to work longer. But you're absolutely right. It's obviously uh, encapsulated most uh, um, sort of concentratedly in the whole discussion around whether kids should go back to school, what's the impact on more mature teachers in that environment. So I think there's there's real tension. Some people are going to want to, to, to jump off the world now. Let me get off the world. I've had enough. If you can do that financially, uh, good for you. You're in, you're in great shape. A lot of people aren't in great shape. I'm going to have to keep going. So I think you're probably going to see some further bifurcation between you know the people are in a good shape and their 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 shape is you know their part of the K is going up and other people frankly who who, who aren't in great shape and are going to have to keep working uh, and these tools now emerging these platforms gig based platforms hustle based platforms as people are beginning to start uh, calling them uh, you know that is an avenue an opportunity for those people if they if they you know choose or need to take advantage of it. You know the way I want to pivot and bring Jim into that question is 
when we at the foundation used to have conversations about the future of work, we were talking about robotics or AI or what was going to change uh, with will we need more workers or fewer workers given the impact of technology. Um, and this question, this pandemic, this economic disruption has brought that really forward, which is another way that people I think have their engagement impacted is by the use of all of this technology and whether or not they still feel included in the future. So can you speak to that a little bit, Jim? Yeah, I would say on the positive side that uh, it was sure handy to have all this technology available when this suddenly dropped on us, you know, that we were able to, to, to pivot. many in many of our jobs, we were able to pivot pretty, pretty quickly and many not, but it certainly helped. Um, I would also kind of say around all this, there are different types of technology that work seem to work better than others, and a lot of it has to do with how the technology is managed. Um, and in my case, user error. Uh, I was trying to get on this webcast earlier, and I need a lot of help from the staff. And even though I use Teams all the time, so. <laughs> but uh, um, so the other thing I want to point out though is investing in your people is going to become even more important. That might seem like it doesn't fit with technology, but. Um, what technology is doing right now is AI is replacing some of the more rudimentary tasks. And so that opens up the opportunities for social skills to become even more important than ever before. And so I think as, as organizations can stay, stay ahead of the curve and communicate opportunities as they're coming so people aren't caught in the dark, I think that's that's really important. When we review different technologies, I mean, the, the, the good technology tends to be a technology that's progress oriented, that helps people see how they're making progress while they're involved in it. Um, you know, technology that they, they find trustworthy, dependable, predictable. That's that's really important foundational, uh, foundational part to technology that it's easy to work with. That might seem like it's a no brainer, but you know, there's a lot of technology that you really have to work work with for a while to figure out how to how to use it. Um, some kind of bells and whistles help a little bit so that it's cool to use. But then the other thing, and this is going to be the way of the future, we're kind of getting this now with some of the nudges and the, some of the strengths based nudges that we've been working on, where we understand the individual strengths and apply that to the information that they get is individualized. The more that technology can become individualized, the more useful it'll be for people. Um, I'll stop there. There might be other commentary on that. Well, let me. Let me switch for a second to a different topic we're getting from the audience. This is a lot of audience questions, I have to tell you, but this is a different question. And I think, uh, Nancy, that it relates to something you worked on earlier in your career when you were thinking, and I hope I have this right, that you did some work on uh, how you talk about flex time or how you think about flex time and child care issues differently if you're a segmenter or an integrator and how managers have to think about how they're addressing those issues. And I think it relates to this question, which is uh, from an audience member here. I was reading about unconscious bias and managers having conversations with working parents versus those without kids and the fact that they need to be careful about making distribution, making decisions about task distributions. What advice do you have about how we have Kind of difficult conversations right now because as, as managers we were all taught to segment out whether or not you were talking to a parent or not and treat everybody equally and now as we try to be sensitive to people with these issues i think these are new boundaries we're kind of being encouraged to cross but what advice do you have for us about how to cross them appropriately yeah that's a really challenging question it's a great question first of all so whoever asked it you you're you're amazingly uh, uh astute I think that this relates a lot actually to something that Jim was talking about earlier about leadership in this kind of era around compassion, right? So having compassion for people, uh, being an individual, you know, taking into account their individual situation is really important, right? And recognizing that and valuing them so that they feel heard and that they feel um, that they feel like they can be their best self right at work and so that's first of all really important and the relationship with the direct supervisor or manager is critical in that in that endeavor right that the that that direct supervisor or manager understands them but that said segmenters don't love those boundaries being crossed so for someone who is a strong segmenter they would prefer you not to know those things and I think that that's one of the reasons that this is so challenging for segmenters at this time, right? Because 
if you have young kids and you've been homeschool or you've been online, so I, I shouldn't say homeschooling, you've been online schooling them as my kids were online schooled in the spring, right? If, if that's what's going on, a lot of them, you know, with younger kids were sitting with their kids, you know, trying to make that online schooling happen in a way that was credible and, and, and okay, depending on the ages of their kids or the needs or what have you. And so they needed to shift their schedule. So back to the flex time issue, flex time became really important for them. And in some of my research, my early research, what I found was segmenters really valued flex time because flex time allows you to shift your work and to chunk it in a way that allows you to focus on your work when you're doing your work and to focus on your family when you're you know, with your family, uh, et cetera. But, you know, so that may be a way to kind of have that conversation with segmenters, right? To bring it back to what kinds of policies and practices are going to enable them to get their work done best, given their family circumstances, given their needs uh, in, this, in this kind of current, very odd situation that we all find ourselves in. We're going to have to have this group back because we have more audience questions that we have time to get to, including, you know, what happens to hands on work and manufacturing, what happens to R&D labs. And so we have a lot more questions, but I'm going to take the moderator's prerogative and, and ask my own as a closing round. So we have four minutes. So each of you gets one minute. This is a lightning round. OK, and we're going to go ladies first. But I'm going to ask each of you this question. And so, Nancy, what is one thing that it, that's happening at Wharton right now? that would be, or that you're seeing in another organization that an employer on this call could learn from? Well, I think that, you know, right now, as with many organizations, we are we are really trying to figure out how to safely bring people back and what the right call is and what the kind of balance is between remote work and remote learning and in and 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 in person experiences. And you know, navigating that is is challenging. And what I think we're learn we're finding is people have a lot of different opinions about that. And I'm not sure we have all the data. And we are a very evidence based organization, uh, as you might expect, as most universities are. And it is very hard not having enough data. So the more data we can get, the I, I think um, the the better we will be. But what we have found is we've had to remain very nimble and flexible and try and, and, and understand that we make a decision one week and the next week that may not be the decision. And the communication, the transparency around the communication and the contextualization of the message becomes very important. And sometimes we make mistakes and we have to correct them. Uh, and, and trying to kind of keep rolling with those punches has been something that I think we're all trying to get better at and and I think will will be important for all of your organizations because I think that's a very common challenge. Thank you so much for that. And and Jim, what do you think? How about how about Gallup? We're spending a lot of time right now really trying to um, help organizations understand how to move from a struggling to a thriving culture that can sustain itself. So that whole notion of resiliency depends a lot on getting the work components right. We know that, that that's a foundation that builds trust. It opens the door for, for impacting people in an even bigger way uh, and all the elements of well-being. And so uh, building a, a high thriving uh, culture for the long term is one thing. And then underneath that, all the all the different elements that go into that journey I mentioned earlier of going from boss to coach and that transition so that managers are equipped to have the right kinds of conversations with people and the right kinds of skills um, to, to, to transition that that journey from um, a struggling to a, to a thriving. Um, we know that that positions organizations to be be better equipped for the next whatever comes and to get through this one. OK, so then you get the last word. How about it, Cognizant? I, I'd, I'd say make the trend your friend. Don't don't be thinking about building back the old world. Think about building out and optimizing the new world. Our underlying supposition is that everything that can go online is going to go online. And this isn't a genie that's going back into the bottle. I think there's huge advantages, huge upsides 
uh, to the world that we're moving into if you can take advantage of it, if you can be adaptive, if you can be uh, leveraging the upside of it. It's super interesting listening to the whole session and talking about the downsides of this way of working. Well, what about the downsides of the old way of working? Lots of people hated that old way of working. Let's embrace this new way of working and optimize that. Uh, I, I think that's that positive hope based message is something that we're trying to institutionalize and spread out across uh, all of Cognizant. I think it's really important. I think that's it's a great note to end on and it, what we we find a lot of people who are afraid it is going to go back to the old way. You know, they have found ways to integrate their lives in a different way and they're afraid of a return completely to the old eight to six Monday through Friday model because there's something here that's really working. So I love ending on that note. You've all three been wonderful panelists, witness all the audience questions and enthusiasm. I hope you'll come back. Uh, thank you very much for joining us and to the audience, thank you for joining us. If you've missed any of the past episodes, you can find them at uschamberfoundation.org on Apple Podcasts, on YouTube and uh, in in the meantime, I hope you'll all stay safe. Uh, think about what about the future can be positive and, and how you can thrive in a, in a new normal. And in the meantime, wash your hands, wear a mask, take care of yourselves and each other. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you all very much.